Hello, Bobby Tours of Frightbox Recording here with an updated studio tour of my studio, Frightbox Recording. Now, if you watched my video that I released a few weeks ago, I talked about how I was having an issue at the studio with a buildup of static electricity, and it drove me insane for years until I finally figured out it was that my carpet was getting old and creating this static issue. Now, in the past, I didn't think it was my carpet. That was probably the last thing I would have thought of because again, I've been in this room for so long and I never had an issue like this. I thought it was the electrical. We had an electrician come in, it wasn't the electrical. Finally, I figured out that it was the second layer of commercial carpet that I placed on top of the original carpet because the original carpet was super nasty and super old uh, that was causing the issue. But what was odd was I placed this down with my friends back in 2015 and it didn't become an issue until 2018. I don't know, I guess the carpet aged to a certain extent around 2018 and started this electricity or static electricity buildup, uh, which was messing up my equipment, uh, causing issues with the recording. Let's put it this way, it was so bad that when I'd go to plug in a microphone at my snake, it would make my monitor blink at my desk. Not good, not good for the equipment. So long story short, I decided to take advantage of the situation of taking everything out of my room and uh, update my rig a little and upgrade the routing capabilities in my studio. Now, if you watch any of my videos, you know I'm a huge fan of simplicity. Um, I don't really care about gear. I don't care about preamps. I don't care about all this stuff that people obsess over because I know through experience that none of that really matters. It all comes down to the source and your technique as a producer. You could achieve great results anywhere, and this studio is a prime, real-world example of this fact. My studio is nothing more than a glorified project or home studio. The only difference now is that now I have a lot of inputs, which I'll explain in this video, but other than that, it's a project studio. Now, when I released that video a few weeks ago where I talked about the issue with the carpet and how I had to have the carpet redone, I mentioned my patch bay, and a few people asked about my routing and were curious about how I have things set up in my studio, and uh, that's why I decided to make this updated studio tour just to explain to you what I have going on and how I'm making the most of my limited space in this room. So this is a small room. It's only 17 by 17. It's not that big, but it has to be functional. Um, I need it to be efficient because we're doing a lot here. We have tons of bands in here all the time, and now I'm going to be doing live recording and uh, live video production as well. So it has to be efficient and multi-purpose and just a very functional space with little clutter. It needs to be plug and play. So without any further ado, Here's to the tour. All right, here we are with an updated studio tour of my studio, Frightbox Recording. Now, if you watched my video where uh, I talked about how I had to tear my studio apart because we had a new carpet put in, here is the new carpet. Uh, I gotta say, the guys did a really good job because the floor underneath was in really, really bad shape. Uh, the plywood was completely just, there were chunks missing. Um, this building is very old, it's about 100 years old, so who knows how long that second floor, because underneath there's like the industrial floor and then there was a second layer of plywood. And even the plywood looked at least, at least 50 years old. And the carpet itself that was on top, we kind of uh, deduced that it was at least from the early 90s, probably 80s, maybe even 70s. And uh, that's what was causing that static issue, which I talked about in that video. There's a link to that video in this video's description if you'd like to check it out and hear my story of terror on how long it took for me to figure out that issue because it was a major, major, major pain in the ass. Now, if you've watched my other studio tour, you're probably thinking, well, it looks pretty much exactly the same. And uh, you're right. The main change here is to my routing and my input, which I'm gonna go over in great detail. So let's start from left to right. Nothing's changed here. Still have my remote controls. Let's turn everything off. So as you can see, my tiki corner is off, desk lights are off, and the drum corner is off. Now I like to keep things uh, super efficient, and straightforward. So for anyone that's recording here, all they have to do, drums on, table on, desk lights on, and here we are. Everything is on with just a few clicks of a few different remote controls. I'm a huge fan of efficiency. I don't want to waste any time in the studio, especially when we have clients in. I want to get right to work as soon as possible and focus on being creative and productive. Now, if you look here, you see a bunch of drum bags. This is the house kit. Uh, it's not set up right now because my good friend Pat has his drum set up. Uh, he rehearses here one day a week with his band Luna Morta, excellent band. Now, if you follow on YouTube, there's a guitar player called Stay Metal Ray, awesome YouTube channel. He is in Luna Morta uh, and it's his band with our friends Jenny Torres, 
Pat Kansian, and Mr. Al on bass. I'll leave a link to their band in this video's description as well, as well as Ray's YouTube channel. Yeah, and they use the room once a week just to rehearse. So again, got my drums here, which aren't set up. Pat's drums here. And then we have some amps. But before we get to the amps, let's talk about this snake here, because this is what people were asking most about was my snake, my patch bay, and just my routing in general. And let me explain it to you in detail. So now obviously this corner where the drums are, are where we're gonna be recording drums. So it makes sense to have the snake right next to the drum set, so we don't have to use super long cables, which saves on setup time. It just makes the most sense. I mean, to have your, you know, your inputs right next to the drum set. I mean, why should you use 20 foot long cables if you can use 10 foot long cables? Now, the way this is set up is extremely straightforward. Um, I've updated it, so it's a little more logical for what we're doing now. Uh, so if you look here, there are 16 XLR ins, and they are going to two of my three interfaces. Yes, I now have three interfaces, each with eight inputs in. So the first eight inputs here are going to interface one, and then inputs nine through 16 are going through interface two. Although 16 is not connected right now, this is going nowhere. For anyone who's recording, they can use this input if they manually patch in using the patch bay, which we're gonna go over when I get to my desk. But all in all, it's extremely straightforward. Eight and eight, 16 in total going in to the two interfaces at my desk. Now I know I mentioned that I have three interfaces, but this snake is only going to two of the three interfaces. Now that's what's going into the interfaces. For the main interface that connects to our computers, uh, we have four outputs that are being sent through this snake. One is for the headphones, and then we have three analog outs coming out of the interfaces. Now the question is, why would we need analog outs coming from the interface? And the reason is simple. Reamping. If we need to reamp and you know send some guitars through this cab with a tube head, so on and so forth, it makes sense to just have the outputs right there. So we could connect the output to my reamp box, which could feed the front of a tube head. We can mic up the cab, connect the mic through one of these XLRs, and we're good to roll. Now I used to only have one output coming through this snake, but now I have three. So the question is, why would I have three outputs from my interface coming through this snake? And the reason why is I can now connect powered monitors to this snake if I'm doing a live recording in this room. So in other words, if I have a band here set up live and we're multi-tracking and the singer wants to hear themselves just as if they were at a venue, I can hook up two power monitors or actually three power monitors to the snake right here without any cables being you know, thrown across the ground. I'm all about cleanliness in a work environment. It just makes things way less stressful and way more fun just like I said, way more creative. Now, the great thing about a lot of modern day interfaces, like my main interface, which is the Motu 8 Pre ES, is it's not only an interface, but it's a digital mixer. So while the tracks are being recorded into my DAW, I could do a live mix for a band if they're playing within this room. Very convenient. I also have a Behringer XR18, which does the same thing, uh, but I use that whenever I'm you know, mixing a band live at a venue. In here, I'm using my Motu which I'll get to in a second. So hopefully that makes sense. That's what's going on with this snake. Like I said, it's pretty straightforward. The only thing that might be slightly out of the norm is that this last channel is not uh, hard patched. It has to be patched manually with the patch bay. But again, I'll get there. It will make sense in a second. All right, and right here is my favorite cab of all time, my oversized Mesa 4x12 with V30 speakers. Now, if you haven't downloaded my impulse response, you can download it for absolutely free. There's a link below in this video's description. The IR is of this exact cab. In my opinion, the best cab of all time, at least for heavy music and metal. Sounds great with Marshalls, oranges, PVs, and up here I have a Randall Thrasher, which is in the road case. Okay, and right here I just have a simple Fender Rumble, which is an excellent little bass amp. It's great for recording if you're recording a band live, uh, because it has an XLR out for your DI, which I think is in the back here somewhere. Yeah, it's right there. What's great about these amps is that they're very light, so if you have to take them to a gig, super light, they sound awesome, they have that XLR out for a clean DI, and they're super loud and powerful, which is crazy considering how light they are. So that's here for when I have to record a band live. I don't really use it for recording, but again, if I'm recording a band that's playing together in a live situation. All right, and here we are at the infamous Tiki Corner. Now, if you've ever watched the movie Day of the Dead, George Romero's Day of the Dead, which is the third movie in his Dead trilogy, there's a scene where the helicopter pilot uh, has this kind of like 
I don't know, it's kind of like a tiki setup behind his RV in this depressed underground bunker. And I have something set up similar to that scene in the movie uh, right here. I love horror films and I love inspiration from horror films. And that's why I have this set up like this. And as you can see, I have a bunch of stuff horror related that my good friend Steve and singer of my band, Ken Kelly, has printed out for me and I have it hanging up in this corner of the room. Along with Paul Stanley circa 1987 or 88, rocking a thong. Now this corner comes in handy when bands have to eat. A lot of times we'll have someone tracking guitar right here or tracking vocals right here or right here or whatever, while the band can chill out, work on the laptop, eat, drink a beer, whatever. Just a fun, cozy little corner. And right here we have some seating for the bands, a mini fridge stock full of water, beer, and other refreshments along with some Frightbox mugs, which you can purchase. There's a link below to the Frightbox merch store where I have t-shirts, mugs, and a lot of other cool stuff on the way. And you can purchase these two mugs of these colors as well as two other colors. So check it out. Again, the link is below in this video's description. Now, before I get to what's in these drawers, as you can see, I have a ton of boom mic stands. Now, if you watched that other video where I had to tear this entire room apart and take everything out, uh, I mentioned color coding all of my mic stands, and I pretty much have three different types of mic stands. Regular boom stands, straight boom stands without the arm, and then mini boom stands. And I mentioned that I color coded each type of stand, which probably seemed ridiculous in that video when I was in that nice spacious warehouse. But as you can see, in the real world, when you're working in a small space, being organized comes in handy. At a quick glance, I could see just by looking at the lower part of the leg, what mic stands are what. So right here, the pink are all my small boom stands, the green are my traditional boom stands and the yellow are my straight boom stands. Again, I color coded them so when they're all crammed up in these corners, I don't have to dig through and take them out, which is really annoying and a time waster. I could just look at the leg and see what kind of stand is where. So little things like that that go a long way. Again, stuff I used to never do that I now do because of how, you know, how helpful it is within the studio environment. And also before we get to the drawers, as you could see, I have some CRT TV set up. Right here I have Doom on Super Nintendo kicking. I have a Super Nintendo controller, Sega Genesis controller, and I have Batman Returns kicking on these other two uh, CRT TVs. The retro games and VHS tapes are all um, digitized and on mini computers that are going 24 seven. So whenever I have someone in here using the studio, all they have to do is turn on the TVs and everything is set up and ready to go. So as you can see, I'm moving around playing Doom for the Super Nintendo. But back to the studio stuff, let's talk about what's in these drawers. Super simple. Shorter XLRs and longer XLRs for room mics and things like that that are, you know, kind of far away from the main snake. Now in the left drawer, we have all of our dynamic mics like SM57s. I know Ben has a bunch of hail microphones here. Dynamic mics and condenser mics. So that way if we need to grab either or, we know where everything is. I used to have all of my mics crammed into one of these boxes, but it makes sense to just separate them by dynamic or condenser. Keeps things nice and neat. Okay, in this box is just some drum hardware stuff and moon gels, as well as some drum tuners. Right here I have the Toombot, which is a great drum tuner. Now these days I don't really use it that much. I pretty much just tune drums by ear, but uh, it's good to have if you wanna, you know, tune your snare to a certain pitch, your toms to a certain pitch, whatever. Great tool. And of course, can't live without coffee. That box contains all of our coffee stuff and accessories. Coffee pot, filters, and I think uh, some mugs and actual coffee itself. Okay, moving right along. Up here, headphones. Uh, we have three sets of headphones. We don't really need any more than that in this small room. Quarter inch cables, speaker cables, uh, an extra DI box, and a bag full of patch cables, which I will talk about when I get to the patch bay in a moment. And down here is just my drawer with, uh, you know, random tools, uh, screwdrivers, duct tape, colored painter's tape for color coding. Um, yeah, just stuff like that. So all of my extra tools are in this box. Now, back in the day, I didn't even have these shelves, but I would just have stuff everywhere. I'd have XLR cables in this corner of the room, that corner of the room, everything would be knotted up. Can't be doing that these days, especially because I have multiple producers and engineers using this studio. It needs to be super duper organized and squeaky clean. And also we have a lot of projects that overlap. So we don't have time to be digging around for, you know, XLR cables or, you know, messing around with different inputs or patching things. Everything just has to be set up and plug and play 24 seven. So before I get to the rig, let's just quickly go through what's going on in these shelves. 
Just extra bottles of water, some cleaning supplies, uh, some cutlery, and some paper towels. And this bottom drawer down here is just all of Pat's stuff, all of his extra drum stuff. And it looks like we have an extension cord. All right, so with that out of the way, let's get to the big tamale here and talk about the rig, the actual recording rig, and how I have it set up for maximum productivity. Now, I know a few people have asked about my patch bay, my snakes. Oh, let me mention this. Now, I already said that there's a snake here for the drums. I now have an additional eight channel uh, snake right here by the desk. And I'll explain to you how this is all set up and the purpose of this. So if we look here, here is my recording rig. Uh, everything is being run off of my 2012 MacBook Pro. Ancient computer, but it's still kicking. At home, I have a new Mac Mini, but I don't bring it here because there's no reason to. The, the 2012 MacBook Pro is still doing everything I need it to, and it's portable. The other thing is that everyone else that records out of here just brings their laptops as well. So this rig is set up to have anyone that wants to work in this room just bring their laptop, plug into the interface, and go. It's as simple as that. If you're using a Mac, you don't have to install drivers. If you're using a Windows PC like Ben is, you do have to install drivers for the main interface, the Motu 8 Pre ES, which I have connected to this USB hub, which is connected normally to my computer. It's not connected right now, but normally it is. So now on the topic of interfaces, let me explain to you in detail what's happening here. As you can see, I have one, two, three audio interfaces. Now, I'm gonna be honest with you. All I need are 16 inputs. I've never needed more than 16 inputs in my entire recording career. But I now have 24 inputs simply to offer flexibility to anyone that wants to record out of this room. For example, my good friend Ben really loves experimenting with different mic placements on drums. And if you're recording a drummer with a lot of drums, it's easy to eat up channels. A lot of these channels get eaten up quicker than you'd think. If you're miking your kick, snare top, snare bottom, toms, maybe even the bottom of your toms, spot miking your cymbals, a lot of times your input channels will be eaten up and there are not many channels left for room mics. And we love room mics in this studio. We try to take advantage of this room and make it sound as big as possible, even though it's not the biggest room in the world. Now on that topic, let me just mention one other thing that I forgot to mention. If you look up here, in the corner of the room, I have two condenser mics that are there permanently, which get used in the drum mix quite often. And I also have a PZM mic that's sitting on the ground behind this shelf at all times as well. So I have three room mics that are set up 24 seven, ready to go for anyone that wants to use them within their production. Oh, and also my reamp rig is sitting on top of this TV. I have a reamp box, a tube screamer, and a noise gate. That gets used a lot as well. But anyway, back to the rig here. So like I said, I've only ever needed 16 inputs, but I now have 24. And the question is, how in the world do I have all of these interfaces working together? Because I'm sure you know that it's not as simple as just taking three interfaces and connecting them all to your computer. They have to be clocked together. And the way I have them clocked together is actually pretty straightforward. Now, the Motu 8 Pre ES, which is right here, is our main interface that connects directly to the computer. So the computer sees this interface. This second uh, Motu, which is just the regular 8 Pre, is light piped into this interface via ADAT. Now the 8 Pre ES is actually clocked to my Motu 8 Pre. So the Motu 8 Pre is the master clock. Now what's great about the 8 Pre ES is not only is it an interface, but it's also a mixer. So you can actually mix a band live and simply use this to capture the tracks going straight into Reaper, Pro Tools, Logic, whatever, and you can mix a band live. Let me show you what I mean. So right here I have the Motu app uh, open up and yeah, you could actually mix a band right within the app itself. Now I don't have the actual mixer set up because I have it set up as a, just a basic uh, USB interface right now, but I do have a preset set up where I have just a mixer set up within this app and I can mix the band completely separate from Pro Tools uh, just within the mixer itself. It's not what's being recorded, it's just what the band will hear through their wedges that would be connected to this snake. So I know I went kind of on a tangent here, but yeah, I just want to explain to you the flexibility of this unit right here, which is a really awesome interface. So that's how I have the 16 channels being sent into my laptop. Now the Arturia, which is an awesome interface I just picked up, is my third interface. And I have this interface being sent into the Motu uh, through ADAT B. So ADAT A, is this unit and A.B is this unit. So a total of 24 channels are being sent 
through to my computer. Eight, eight, and eight. So now the question is, how do I have this unit clocked? Very simple. The main interface's clock source is the Motu 8 Pre, the one up here. And then I'm sending out through word clock, through a BNC cable, to this interface, the clocking information. So even though this is my main interface, this is my main clock source, and everything is being clocked by this unit up here, the first mode two. Now, just to be extra in depth, I have this interface being connected to the computer via USB, but it's capable of Thunderbolt, and also you could hook it up through a network cable, just a regular, what do you call it, Cat5, Cat6 connector, using a protocol called AVB, which I haven't even had a chance to use yet. I'm not sure how well it works with PC, I'm sure it works fine, but honestly, USB is plenty powerful. We don't have issues with lag or anything. I've never had an issue with latency. I know a lot of people complain about latency, but that's never been a thing here. Uh, as long as you set your buffer relatively small, you should be in good shape. And I've been doing it that way since way back in 2006, using a 2006 MacBook Pro with only two gigs of RAM. Not the same rig, but I was using a, back then I was using a Digio 2, an Avid Digio 2. Okay, so that explains the interfaces, right? The question is, what is the point of this patch bay? Now, as you can see, I don't use any external preamps, no external outboard gear. This is pretty much just a USB interface just on steroids. Extremely simple rig here. But again, the question is, why do I have a patch bay then? Flexibility. I'm only using this patch bay uh, to give whoever's recording out of this room flexibility for what's being sent into the system. Now, if you remembered, I had 16 channels in on the snake back here, and I said channel 16 is not connected, right? And that's because I have a direct box that's normaled to my main interface. So for example, if I have Brianna here recording guitars or something, she doesn't have to mess around with any of these other interfaces. All she has to do is go to channel eight on the main mode two, and that DI box is connected directly at all times. So what happens, for example, if Ben wants to use channel 16 over at the drums? Well, it's simple. If we look at my patch bay here, my DI box is connected at the top on channel 20 of the patch bay, and it's going straight into the ES channel eight right here. Now, if there's nothing patched in, this connection is made automatically. That's what they call a normaled connection. But let's say Ben wants to use channel 16 on the snake. All he has to do is go to 16 right here, Patch it in. And now, this DI box is no longer connected to the 8 Pre. But channel 16, if I walk over, this guy right here is now going to the Mode 2 8 Pre ES. So now all 16 channels can be used. As you can see, it's just another way to be ultra flexible and to make use of this limited space that I have here. Now that explains that snake. If we look down here, this is an eight channel snake. And right now I have it set up in such a simple way. Channels one through five are connected directly to this interface right here, to the Arturia. So let's say someone's recording here and they're using up all 16 channels over at the drum set and they wanna add some additional room mics. All they have to do is connect XLRs to this snake. And this snake has some length, so you could drag it out to the middle of the room, which is you know convenient as well. But let's say they wanna get crazy and they wanna add even more room mics. And like I said, those room mics up there are connected at all times, as well as a PZM that's sitting behind this shelf. And if you look here on my snake, the mono PZM, room left, room right, are normaled to 8 at B6, 8 at B7, and 8 at B8. So these three channels on the Arturia right here, six, seven, and eight, are automatically connected to these room mics by default without any patch cables. But let's say for some reason, whoever's recording here, you know, they wanna use all 24 channels and they don't wanna use my room mic's up here. Now in the past, these were just set up and that's it. The only way they would be able to repatch was to you know, take the desk out and go in the back and who wants to do that? But now, all you'd have to do, let's say um, whoever's recording, you know, they're cool with the mono, uh, let's say they're cool with, with you know, the left and right rooms, but they don't wanna use the mono room. They have their own mic they wanna use. All you have to do is connect to channel six and then you, know, you could patch this in anywhere you want. So then you would take channel six on the mini snake and patch it into 8 at B number six. And there you go. So I know that might be somewhat overwhelming and confusing if you're not used to patching, but it really is super simple. It's just a matter of, you know, offering extreme flexibility to anyone that's recording here 
They don't have to use my you know, room mics if they don't want to. They don't have to use the DI box if they need the extra channels. But to be honest with you, 24 channels is a lot, especially when you're in a small space like this recording just drums. So the only time anyone's really gonna need to use this patch bay is if they're recording a band live or if they just have a massive drum set and they really don't wanna use uh, my room mic setup. But me personally, I rarely go beyond 16 tracks. Anyway, this is more here for anyone else that's using the room. And finally, I have my uh, Mackie Big Knob, which I've had for about a decade now, uh, which interestingly enough, I've got these new monitors. I think they're Mackie MR or something. I don't even know what they are. They're good though, whatever they are, they're good. Um, I don't mix here. I just record here, but I bought these monitors. We thought there was something wrong with the left monitor, which was strange because we were having issues with the old Samson monitors on the left side. And I thought that was an issue with the actual Samson monitor. That's why I bought these new ones. And it turns out I just have to clean the contacts in my mute switch in my control center here. Um, so I bought these monitors for absolutely no reason, but hey, at the end of the day, you know, it's always good to have spares. So a fun little fact there for you. And right here, I don't even have a headphone amp. I don't need one because the control center here, the Mackie Big Knob has a pretty powerful headphone amp built in. And this right here is connected to the Snake, the 16 channel Snake. So when the drummer's recording, all we have to do is connect headphones right back over at the Snake. So there are no cables across the floor. And there's an extra output here if whoever's engineering wants to use some headphones as well, which I think Ben uses a lot as well. I think he has in-ears that he uses, if I'm not mistaken. Um, mute switch, mono, dim, which I never use. Um, and I have a subwoofer, which you could turn on or off, which is below the desk. And then the main monitors, which you could turn on or off. Unfortunately, they don't make this unit anymore. I do have a newer Mackie Big Knob, but it's actually an interface as well as a control center. These are a relic of the past. This is not an interface. This is only a monitoring station. So the outputs of my main interface right here, the Mode 2 A Pre ES are connected to here, and this is connected to my monitors. This setup is extremely simple. It's pretty much a bedroom setup that any you know high school kid could have. Just like I said, it's sort of on steroids. Uh, just extra inputs and extra flexibility. So whoever's recording here is not limited by pretty much anything. And that's it. That's the updated Frightbox Studio Tour uh, 2021. Okay, well, I hope that didn't overwhelm you. I know that's a lot to take in if you're not familiar with how interfaces work, but just remember this. It's extremely straightforward. I don't have any analog gear or any analog, you know, um, hardware or outboard gear or even external preamps. I have nothing against that stuff. I've owned some throughout my career and also I love using it when I'm at other studios, but I know you really don't need any of that. I know this is gonna piss off a lot of gearheads. All you need is a basic interface, a relatively dead space, which you could achieve pretty much anywhere. And that's it, and again, my project studio is a prime real world example of this. It's never held me back. I've never had anyone complain and we're booked solid all the time with real bands. It's not the gear, it's your technique and workflow. Now I also wanna quickly mention this. If you watched my previous studio tours, you might remember that I used to have a second smaller space and uh, I decided to give that space up simply because with what's going on in the world, it didn't make sense to have so many people crammed into a small area like that. So my good friend Ryan Lehman uh, has taken over that space and I'm eventually gonna be building out a second area similar to this studio that's maybe 17 by 17, similar dimensions over at my house. And if I don't do it at my house, I might rent out a second space. But for now, this space is sufficient enough. It served me well throughout the past 15 years and will continue to serve me well throughout the future. So please let me know. I'd love to hear your opinion. What did you think of my studio? Was it inspirational? Is it a turnoff to you that I'm not using an analog desk or analog hardware at all? Please let me know. I'd love to hear your opinion and I'd love to hear what you're using within your studio. Leave a comment in the comment section below and I'd love to hear about it. If you found this video helpful, like, comment, subscribe, and share. And do not forget to click the little bell icon so you can be notified every time I upload one of my weekly videos on all things metal and rock production. You can both like and follow me on Facebook and Instagram. Links are in the description below. Now I want you to achieve killer results within your studio right now with the gear you already have. Because the truth is, gear is no longer an issue. You can achieve amazing sounding productions with virtually any gear, even super cheap gear. And this is why I put together my polished production checklist. The real issue with home recordings is that most home studio owners tend to gloss over crucial, important steps throughout the production process. And what ends up happening is they often blame their gear when it's really just, again, user error. So be sure to download my PDF guide that'll help point you in the right direction and help you not gloss over these important steps and pay close attention to them because it'll make a massive difference in your productions if you follow what I tell you 
in this PDF guide. So again, you can download my polished production checklist. There's a link below in this video's description. Till next time, happy recording.